Okay. I think we still have time so we can cover some of the controlled cash sharing mechanisms as well. Uh, we've covered efficient cash utilization so far and a little bit of efficient memory utilization. But there was another problem with caching, which is how to control the sharing of the cash. Now, efficient cash utilization helps us a little bit because if you can predict what's high reuse and low reuse, where you're controlling what you put into the cache. But you're not explicitly partitioning the cache across different applications. And there have been many mechanisms that are proposed to explicitly partition the cache, and we're going to talk about some of these. Uh, the first idea, this actually a general idea that's applicable to many resources, is utility-based partitioning of the cache. The goal is to maximize system throughput in this case. And the observation is that not all threads and applications benefit equally from caching. And we know that simple LRU replacement is not good for system throughput. Uh, the idea is to allocate more cache space to applications that obtain the most benefit from that cache space. We're going to compute the marginal utility of a cache block, and we're going to assign uh, more cache to that application that gets more marginal utility from cache. So the high-level idea can be applied to other shared resources as well. This is actually proposed uh, in this paper early on for caches. Actually, early on, this was proposed for main memory. Uh, Harold Stone has a paper from 1990s that looks at, that describes uh, a, a mechanism that partitions main memory across different applications based on the utility of allocating another cache block to each application. And you pick the application, uh, you, pick, uh, you, you allocate the block to the application that benefits most from that block, from that additional block. Uh, this was proposed in this paper, but this paper has a very uh, difficult implementation, in my opinion. So this paper has a much more amenable implementation, and that's why it's been considered uh, significantly after that work. So what is the marginal utility of a cache way? Basically, uh, way is an entire way of a cache. This is the misses, uh, we're, we're going to define utility as misses with A ways minus misses with B ways. So hopefully A is greater than B. <laughs> and we're going to take a look at uh, utility curves. So if you look at this, uh, this is what happened. Uh, on the x-axis, I show the number of ways allocated to each application, uh, to one application at a time, uh, from a 16-way, one, one megabyte L2 cache. And this is the miss rate, misses per 1,000 instructions that that application sees. This application is a streaming application. And it actually doesn't benefit from more caching, yes. Oh, what is A-ways? Uh, this, this is the way in a cache. So let me actually, there's a cache way. So this is a set associated cache. Right? And with a direct map cache, there's only one way. Right? But with a set associative cache, you can actually, uh, for a given set, a block can be placed in different ways, right? You can have a way 0, way 1, way 2, way 3, and you have four ways in this case. Right? You basically index into the cache, and the block can be in any of those ways. You basically divide your cache vertically. In a fully associative cache, let's say you have 16,000 blocks in your cache. Every location can be a way. That's 16,000 ways. That's the number of parallel sets. Exactly, the number of parallel searches that you can do in the cache. Basically, the number of locations a block can map to. Right. OK. Uh, so as you give more ways, so 16 ways, you can, you can also think of this as allocating a 1 16th of the cache over here to this application. So it doesn't matter to this application, right? As you increase the cache size that's allocated to this application, its miss rate doesn't change. So this application has low utility from the cache. Whereas another application has very high utility. As you increase the size of the cache that's dedicated to this application, its miss rate reduces significantly. This application has saturating utility. That's uh, an integer application. At this point, it starts fitting in the cache. So it just benefits if you give it 5 out of 16 ways, 5 out of 16, 5 sixteenths of the cache, it just fits. Let's take a look at uh, the motivation of utility-based shared cache partitioning. We have a shared cache. We, have a sim we, have, we can partition the cache in 16 different uh, uh, 
in, in the granularity of uh, one sixteenth of the cache. And how do we do that partitioning? These are two applications, earthquake simulator and uh, place and route application. LRU can give you any partition, right? LRU can give this much of the cache to this earthquake simulator and this much of the cache to VPR. But utility-based cache partitioning, the ideal is really at the knee of the curve, right? You would like to give only as much cache as, to this application as it benefits. Utility-based cache partitioning can provide two, uh, two ways here, or actually three ways here, and the remaining 13 ways to this application. That way you get much better performance, much less, much smaller miss rate, right? Because miss rate is the addition of these two miss rates. So that's the idea. We'd like to improve performance by giving more cache to the application that benefits more from cache. Then the question is, how do we actually do this? Uh, basically, we somehow need to monitor the utility of different cores from the cache. How much benefits each core or each application will get from the cache. We'll, have, we'll need to have a partitioning algorithm that considers those utility curves. And we're going to have replacement support to enforce these partitions. Basically, for each core, we're going to construct something like this, utility curve. And the partitioning algorithm will say, Oh, the best point is to allocate this much cash to eQuake and this much cash to VPR. So assume that the state's the same over the over an interval. Okay. Yes, we're going to do it on an interval basis. Yeah. You could do it in a profile ba uh, profile based way, and then you could do it early on, but that's uh, that doesn't work as well. Okay, so how do we actually do this utility-based uh, utility monitors? For each core, we're going to simulate LRU policy using the auxiliary tag directory. Again, we have another tag directory. And we're going to have hit counters for each way. So if you allocate zero way, you're going to have some, more, some hits. If you allocate two ways, you're going to have some hits. If you allocate three ways, you're going to have some hits. We're going to have hit counters in each way as we allocate. And LRU is a stack algorithm. Uh, as hit counts give you utility. For example, hits with two ways is uh, hits in way zero plus hits in way one. Let's take a look at that example. So let's say we have uh, these, this four-way cache and we have a count of how many hits you get in each of these ways. Uh, and you, you can take these counters and uh, calculate the values over here. So counter at position zero means MRU position. You get 30 hits in the MRU position. You get 20 hits in the second MRE position, and you get 15 hits here, and you get 10 hits here. And remaining, you don't get hits, you get 25 misses. So if you construct the number of misses curve here, this is the number of ways you allocate to this application. If you allocate only one way, how many misses do you get? If you allocate four ways, you get 25 misses. Right? If you allocate three ways, you get 25 plus 10, 35 misses. If you allocate two ways, you get 25 plus 10 plus 15. If you allocate only one way, you get all of these misses. And if you allocate zero ways, you get all of these misses in the end. And that's not shown here, because we're going to allocate at least one way. And you can see the paper. Basically, you can construct, once you have these counters for each of the positions in the auxiliary tag directory that emulates LRU, you can actually form this curve. Uh, so the problem is, of course, these counters are a lot. If you want to have it for each application, you don't want to have it for every set, so we're going to use the dynamic set sampling that I described earlier. So that's a substrate that can be used in many cache optimizations. And again, we have 32 sets are sufficient. And storage is less than two kilobytes for, per this utility monitor. So we're going to sample to form this mystery rate curve. So once you have the mystery rate curves, how do you actually decide a partitioning algorithm? How many, what fraction of the cache do you allocate to core one? What fraction of the cache do you allocate to core two? And if you allocate A ways to core one, you allocate 16 minus A ways to core two. How do you decide A? So hits to core one is this. If you allocate zero ways plus one ways plus two ways, dot, 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 until A minus one. Hits to core two is everything that goes up to 16 minus A minus one. Basically, we select an A that maximizes hits, uh, that makes, maximizes the total hit rate. And partitioning is done every five million cycles. Does that make sense? OK. But we're going to fix this algorithm because there are issues with it. <laughs> so we need to have way partitioning support 
for this, and this is provided in previous work. Each line has core ID bits, each cache block. On a miss, uh, we look at the number of ways occupied in a set by the miscausing application. If the ways, if the number of ways that's occupied is less than the ways that's given, then we can allocate one more block to this application in this set, right? Because this uh, application uh, did not occupy the ways it's given. Otherwise, we pick uh, the LRU line from the miscausing application, this application, because it's already exhausted the ways it's given. Well, I'm going to skip the performance metrics here. But if you do this, if you do this in a two-core system, this is the performance you would get. For a bunch of workloads, this is the performance of the LRU policy. That's dynamic shared cache partitioning. That's free for all with LRU. Health and health means you have private caches. You divide the cache into two, and it's private. So that's similar to shared caching, actually. It goes both ways. Sometimes shared caching is better. Sometimes private caching is better, depending on the workload mix. But if you do utility-based cache partitioning, you significantly improve performance, because you're really partitioning, giving more cache to uh, the application that benefits from that more cache. And these are actually individual performance results. This also improves fairness, it turns out. I'm going to skip these, but uh, well, this is the IPC throughput, but if you, you can actually see the individual workloads as well. So there are some problems here because it's not a, it's not a scalable approach, and this has non-convex curves. Uh, if you look at the time complexity of partitioning uh, for two cores, number of possible partitions is similar to the number of ways. But possible partitions actually increase exponentially with the number of cores. For a 32-way cache, you get this many partitions with four cores. With eight cores, you get this many partitions. So you don't want that kind of algorithm, right? You don't want to exhaustively search all possible ways. So problems is MP hard, you really need a scalable partitioning algorithm. Uh, so that's the scalability part. There's also a problem with the non-convex curves, and I'll take a look at that. Basically, what we are looking at is a greedy algorithm. Uh, greedy algor so you could actually design a greedy algorithm. You could allocate one block to the application that has the maximum utility for that block. That's one way of solving the scalability problem, right? Instead of, instead of doing this. Yes. Yeah. We saw non-convex curves. And I'll show you examples. I think I'll show you examples. I don't remember, but we'll see. Uh, the paper has examples. It's it's, it's actually not my work. This is, this is uh, Moin de Gracie's work. So he has found out all of these curves. Uh, but this algorithm is not scalable because as you increase the number of cores, and as you increase the A's that you search for, uh, it's, it becomes exponential. Right? So one, po one potential solution is the algorithm that's developed by Harold Stone from IBM for uh, memory partitioning. And you can allocate one block to the application that has a maximum utility for that block. You just have a look at of one, basically. Who, who should I give the next block to or next way to? Who would benefit from giving, getting one more way? Uh, so this is nice. It gives you optimal partitioning when utility curves are convex, but you get, you get pathological behavior for non-convex curves, right? That's, and here's an example. Actually, here, what you can, uh, what uh, I'll show you is allocating one more cache block would give you a bad uh, performance. So we, uh, greedy algorithm considers the benefit from only the immediate next block or immediate next way. It doesn't look ahead, if you will. And if you have a curve like this, now this gets a lot of benefit by allocating three, block, three ways. It doesn't get that much benefit by allocating the next way. Right? But if you look ahead a little bit, it, gets a lot, it, it has a lot more utility from those three ways. So what we're going to try to do, well, if you look at the greedy algorithm, in each iteration, it looks at the utility for one more way or one more block. So for application A, it has better utility because it gets 10 misses, right? Uh, it, it reduces the misses count by 10. So it gives one block to A. It gives one block to A because B has zero utility, right? It gives one block to A until all of the ways are exhausted, right? All of the blocks are assigned. So all blocks are assigned to A even if B has the same miss reduction with fewer blocks. And that's what we see here. So this is not the optimal partitioning. The optimal partitioning should really happen first you give ways to B, and then you allocate ways to A. And if you have a greedy algorithm, look at algorithm, uh, we're going to define marginal utility as utility per cache resource. That's where this is the same thing that I described earlier. Maybe it's reversed a little bit. 
but basically it's the utility divided by the number of ways that you've given to the resource uh, to the application. Uh, so this lookahead algorithm considers this marginal utility for all possible cache allocations. We're going to select the application that has the maximum value for the marginal utility and allocate as many blocks as required to get that maximum utility, marginal utility. And we're going to repeat until all blocks in the cache are assigned. And whenever I say blocks, it's ways in this case. Let's take a look at the same curves with the lookahead algorithm. In this case, iteration one, basically we're going to look ahead. Marginal utility of A is really 10 divided by 1, because that's the best utility that you can get. Because you give it one more way, you get 10 misses re reduced. Marginal utility of B is not 0, but it's 80 divided by 3, because you get a miss reduction of 80 if you allocated 3 blocks. So B gets 3 blocks because 80 divided by 3 is larger than 10 divided by 1. So we give 3 blocks to B. After that, marginal utility of B is 0, because whatever look ahead you have, it's always zero additional misreduction, whereas marginal utility of A is 10 divided by 1. So in the next five iterations, A gets all of the blocks, remaining blocks. So this gives you a much better miss rate reduction. Okay. And time complexity, you can read the paper or you can derive this yourself, but it's waste square divided by 2 approximately. Okay, so what are the results of all of this? Uh, greedy algorithm, uh, well, let's take a look. Uh, this is for four cores. If you look at this, this is greedy algorithm, look at algorithm, and evaluating all potential solutions. This is the, uh, this is the solution we wanted to avoid. This is the non-scalable solution. And greedy algorithm doesn't look ahead. Look at algorithm is what I described. So if you look at this, this is just four mixes, but there are some mixes where it doesn't matter, but there are some mixes where the greedy algorithm does actually worse than LRU, because it gives you a not, not, not optimal cache partition, actually a bad cache partition. Uh, but in most cases, look at algorithm is similar to evaluating all potential partitions. And it's much more scalable. OK. Let's take a look at advantages and disadvantages of this. The advantages over LRU, this improves system throughput, and it better utilizes the shared cache. Uh, the disadvantage is this doesn't take into account fairness, right? So we're going to look at approaches that actually take into account fairness now. So one example, uh, this doesn't take into account fairness because two applications may benefit from the cache a lot. But this algorithm allocates more cache to the application that benefits a little bit more. So even though an application is benefiting from the cache, it will not get to use the cache because there's another application that benefits just a little bit more. And that's not fair because both applications are actually benefiting from the cache. But then we're trying to improve system proof without not being try, uh, trying to be fair, right? And there are limitations. So partitioning is actually limited to waste. What if you have number of ways that are less than number of applications? And there's uh, scalability issues also. And there are people have tried to solve these problems. When you have a distributed cache, when your cache is uh, not shared, then how do you actually compute utility? And many, many systems going forward uh, have distributed caches uh, because you don't have a single shared cache, but you have, as I showed in the, a previous picture, you have an L2 cache that's distributed. You have L2 cache, uh, bank zero, L2 cache, bank one, L2 cache, bank two, and you have different cores, core zero, core one, core two, dot, dot, dot. Then how do you do this utility-based cache partitioning? Because all of the countries that are at different places need somehow have communication across different cores. Okay. So let me take a look at another example very quickly. This is fair cache part uh, shared. Yes? Can you also, how, how do you get the utility curves of the applications? I mean, is that assumed given? Are you profiling them? Or is it something so, Yeah, it's profiled based on those utility counters. So for each way, you keep track of how many hits have I received in this way for 5 million cycles. And next 5 million cycles, you decide based on those counters how much cash to allocate. Yeah, it's a, it's a predictive mechanism. Now, that may not work also. That's, what if past behavior is not a good predictor of utility, future utility, right? Yes, it's all hardware. Yes, it's all hardware. This is all hardware. OK, let's take a look at a mechanism that actually tries to be fair. So this mechanism is, tries to improve performance, but it's not necessarily fair. Uh, and fairness, uh, one, one definition of fairness, fairness is always a hard concept, right? It's very hard to define what's fair and what's not fair, and sometimes in the eye of the beholder. Uh, 
basically one definition of fairness is we would like to equalize the slowdowns of multiple threads sharing the cache. Uh, the idea is somehow dynamically estimate slowdowns due to sharing, slowdown compared to when the application has all of the cache to itself, and assign cache blocks to balance those slowdowns. And uh, we're going to look at a solution that approximates slowdown with change in miss rate. And we already know that this is not true, right? If you look at the MLP aware cache replacement, it's not true that slowdown always correlates with miss rate. But that's okay. This is simple, but not accurate because of different misses have different costs. Miss rate is not the, uh, there's some correlation between miss rate and slowdown, but it's not exactly the same. So this is this paper uh, from North Carolina State that I will describe. By the way, this approach is actually applicable to many different shared resources. We have applied this general approach to memory scheduling. Uh, the memory scheduler dynamically estimates the slowdown of different threads and tries to balance those slowdowns. That was the first uh, approach we took when we designed a fair memory scheduler. And I'll describe that uh, in the last lecture in the uh, next, uh, next week's lectures. But let's take a look at the problem. If you have a shared cache like this, one application may need this much cache, another application may also need this much cache, and when they run together, this application, because it's, it has more muscle maybe, uh, gets rid of the blocks of this application. As a result, this application's throughput is significantly reduced due to unfair cache sharing. Right? So we'd like to prevent that. And this is some results this is, uh, that, uh, from that paper that shows what is the normalized cache misses that you get and what is the normalized IPC. So they show some correlation between the cache misses that gzip application gets when it's running with different applications and the IPC, IPC performance that it gets. So there is some correlation certainly between the cache misses and IPC. So there are a bunch of fairness me metrics they examine. Ideally, a uniform slowdown means all applications are slowed down by the same amount. T-shared is the time taken by the application when it's sharing resources with other applications. And T-alone is the time taken by the application when it's running alone on the same system. Ideally, we would like to equalize all of that. That's uniform slowdown. Uh, and that's what this ideally is. But this ideal may be hard to estimate. How do you estimate the slowdown of an application? Actually, this is a very interesting topic that we will discuss later on uh, next week uh, when we talk about memory sharing. And uh, uh, the, these researchers have decided that they will not estimate this directly, and then they will approximate it this way. Basically, mi uh, basically this way, actually. Misrate mis mis shared divided by misrate alone. Somehow, you're going to get the misrate shared and divide it by misrate alone. Uh, so they, they, will, uh, they use block granularity partitioning, and they basically can keep track of the current partition, and they have a target partition. Because target partition is, uh, they want to achieve equal slowdown, right? So they can increase and decrease the partition allocate to a different mechanism, a different, uh, uh, different uh, core or different processor in this case, processor one, processor two. And how do you do that? Basically, let's say processor one is occupying 448 bytes of cache space and processor two is occupying 576. If you want to reduce processor one and increase processor two, whenever P2 gets a cache miss, you get rid of a block from P1. And I think the color coding is broken here, but, oh yeah, it's terribly broken, but <laughs> this is supposed to be orange and that's supposed to be, anyway. Okay, you got the idea, basically. You would like to do the right thing to <laughs> get to the target part partition, simple idea. So how do you do this? Basically, you somehow get miss rate alone. And this is the part where this paper, I think, doesn't do too well. They actually run the application alone for a while. Uh, to get the miss rate alone. And that, that is vulnerable to a lot of issues, I think, because that, once you run the application alone for a while, you're actually reducing throughput a lot because you're not utilizing the rest of the system. And I'm going to show you a mechanism later on next week that actually doesn't, do the, it doesn't run the application alone. So you somehow get the miss rate alone, and you compute the miss rate shared. Miss rate shared is relatively simple, right, because when you're running together with other applications, you know the miss rate. Let's say you figured out miss rate alone, and uh, 20% and 5%, you have a target partition initially is equal. You measure miss rate shared. You figure out that the miss rate of P1 is 20%, but P2 is 15%. So this is not fair, right? If you divide this, miss, P1 slowdown is 1, P2 slowdown is 3, because 15 divided by 5 is 3. Which means that you'd like to change the partition. So the way they change the partition is 
they reduce uh, the partition of the application that's uh, fast, they increase the partition of the application that's slow. And they add 64 kilobytes, that's the granularity of partitioning. And they go one more interval. And they figure out that misrate shared now goes, P1's misrate doesn't change. 20%, P2's misrate reduces because you gave it a little bit more partition, but it goes to 10%. But it's still not fair. 20 divided by 20 is one, 10 divided by five is two. And that's still not fair, so you repartition again. You take away from processor one, 64 kilobytes, you give 64 kilobytes to processor two in the next interval. In the next interval, again, you compute the miss rate at the end of the interval, and this is what you figure out. 25% versus 9%. And you do the calculation again, and in this case, it's still not fair, but it may be that you can do rollback. It's not there here, but is it rollback? Is it, does it require rollback? I'm not sure. I don't think it does, but that's okay. <laughs> So you can actually backtrack, basically. If you if you overshot your partition, you can backtrack. And that's that's how the mechanism operates. Can I talk to it then? Yes. Instead of all can you talk to it then it's like you were That's right, exactly. Exactly. Or you could yeah, it's it's a hard problem because you could uh, yeah. Which one's much simpler? Yes. That's right, yes. Yeah. That's right, yes. Now you can imagine different algorithms also. That's okay, so what are the results with this? Basically, if you look at this, and I think there are a bunch of fairness mechanisms, PLRU is a pseudo LRU, that's the baseline. If you look at the combined performance, performance is actually higher uh, with this mechanism, with a fair mechanism. In not, all, not in all cases, but in some cases. And actually, fairness is much, much higher if you look at this. So the average fairness improves significantly. And these are for different metrics of fairness. Now, different, different methods of optimizing fairness for miss rates uh, or uh, misses themselves, absolute number of misses. So improve, this improves both fairness and throughput. And actually, this, these results show that uh, this is the effect of the partitioning interval. How often do you do this? 10,000 cycles to 80,000 cycles. And they found that it's better to do it at a fine grain every 10,000 cycles, because application behavior changes quickly. And fine-grained partitioning is important for both fairness and throughput. As you increase the partitioning interval, the performance reduces and fairness also reduces, because uh, normalized fairness, I think the lower is better. Uh, actually, higher, lower is better in this case. Okay, so uh, there are a bunch of benefits to fair caching. Uh, the problem with unfair cache sharing is you get suboptimal throughput, threat starvation, priority inversion. An application actually can be high priority, but you give it less cache. And you get thread mix dependent performance. If you have fair caching, you solve all these first three problems, perhaps. You get better fairness, better throughput, and likely you can simplify the OS scheduler design. Because OS, when it allocates uh, uh, an application to a core, it's assuming that it'll make progress. It won't starve. And if you can provide this proportional progress, that's why the slowdown-based approach is an interesting approach because you, provide, you try to provide proportional progress to all applications compared to when they're run alone. So you can likely simplify OS scheduler design this way. So let's take a look at advantages and disadvantages of the approach. No, no starvation and better average throughput, which are pretty good. Again, the scalability is hard because of the way uh, a loan performance is determined. Let's say you have 32 cores sharing a, a cache uh, to get the alone performance, you need to stop all of the cores and run one application in one core. And that leads to a lot of throughput loss. So you don't want that. And there, uh, always you can argue what is a good fairness metric. Uh, and I'll discuss some, some of that later on. And this approach, actually many approaches don't provide performance isolation and we'll take a look at in the memory system later on. Okay, and also if you're running an application alone for an interval to determine the alone miss rate, this can be incorrect because you're estimating the alone miss rate in one interval and you're comparing it to a different miss rate in a different interval. Right? You're, you're compa comparing apples and oranges, actually. And we've seen this in other uh, systems where we tried this and it didn't work too well. Okay, I don't know if I should continue. It's 9.59 a.m. But I can continue and talk about software-based 
shared cash management. Yes, you can go on for 13 more minutes. Okay, 13 more minutes. Uh, that's yes. Okay, we'll go <laughs> however uh, the, the camera dictates. And I don't have that much more left anyway, but I'll talk about uh, a, a different approach, which is software-based shared cash management. This is what you can do in today's systems. Uh, these assume no hardware support. Basically, they still use demand-based cash sharing, whatever the hardware has today. Then the key question is, how can the OS operating system best utilize the cash? So you could do several things. I'm not going to discuss this that much. You can do cash sharing aware threat scheduling. This has limited applicability, in my opinion. Basically, uh, you can schedule workloads that play nicely together in the cache. If an application is streaming, you don't put it in the cache with another application that has very good locality. That's the idea. Uh, or you can try to estimate the working set size and hope, hope, uh, schedule the applications that fit together nicely in the cache together. This requires some kind of profiling of application behavior. But this also requires that you have a good mix of applications, right? You need to have a large mix of applications to choose from and a lot of variety. And that doesn't always happen. Uh, and you can read this paper. But the other approach that actually partitions the cache, regardless of whatever application you have in the system, is page coloring. Uh, you can do page coloring in a cache sharing aware manner. And this is an interesting approach. There's a more general approach than this approach, I think, because this requires the threads to be present. This doesn't require threads to be present. Or this doesn't require any characteristics from threads. So the idea here is dynamically monitor the miss rate over an interval, very similar to the previous one, and change virtual to physical mapping to minimize the miss rate uh, by trying out different partitions. So you see, we are still going to allocate different partitions to different applications, but we're going to allocate in a way that doesn't require hardware support. And that's right. There will be software overhead. But people have shown results with real systems, actually, these two work. Uh, works, actually this work has shown results with a real system that has that software overhead and still gets good performance. Even with non-scalable algorithms. Uh, because the cache sharing can be pretty bad, apparently. <laughs> okay, so you could do two approaches. Mine, you, could, you could actually partition the cache statically. You can predetermine the amount of cache blocks are allocated, uh, amount of cache blocks allocated to each program at the beginning of its ex execution, and divide the shared cache to multiple regions and repartition and partition the cache regions through OS page address mapping. Right. Uh, this doesn't have that much overhead, right? Initially, because you never change the partition. You could, do, you could be more aggressive and you could do dynamic cache partitioning. You adjust cache code among processes dynamically by recoloring the pages. Uh, basically, dynamically change process cache users through OS page, pass, page remapping. And we're going to take a look at how this is done. This is again red, but that's okay. I guess it's different. Uh, basically, if you think about it, this is uh, physical memory can be divided into different colors, and colors map to different cache sets. Uh, cache partitioning ensures that two threads are allocated pages of different colors. This way, you allocate pages to thread A that are red and blue, and this way, red and blue pages are mapped only to these indices in the cache. Now you can separate thread A from thread B because thread B can be allocated pages that are yellow and green. No, wait. Wow, this is really different. This is supposed to be green and this is supposed to be gray. But that's OK. <laughs> I don't know what kind of coloring, color, color remapping mechanism that this is using. But it's, hope, it's, it's not as good as page, page remapping, I think. <laughs> OK, but this way you can partition the cache. Well, why does this happen? Because operating system can control what virtual address is mapped to, what virtual page is mapped to what physical page, and that influences the index of a page in the cache. Basically, operating system does this translation, virtual page maps to physical page, page offset doesn't change. But this also determines, the physical address also determines the set, set index, and there are a bunch of bits in the physical page number that are overlapped with the set index. And these are called the page color bits. If you have four bits over here, then you can have 16 different colors. And you can say these colors are allocated to this application. Uh, page numbers that are 0, 0, 0, 0 are assigned to this application. And I'm not going to allocate that page number that ends with 0, 0, 0, 0 to any other application. That way, you've now partitioned your cache. And it's a beautiful mechanism. Uh, of course, it has downsides too. But basically, these page color bits determine 
the indices that the application uh, applications blocks can get mapped to. Yes, all cache lines in a physical page are cached in one of these regions, one of these colors, basically. An OS can control the page color of a virtual page through address, through address mapping by selecting a physical page with a specific value in its page color bins. That's the idea. So how do you do static page, uh, cache partitioning using page coloring? Basically, you can, you can group the physical pages into page bins according to their page color. And now you know which indices they occupy in the cache. And process one and process two can have their page tables this way. And process one can be assigned these colors, whereas process two can be assigned separate colors. This way, you partition your cache, which is nice. Uh, the downside is main memory space needs to be partitioned too. And this is actually a bad downside of uh, memory uh, cache partitioning. You can actually get rid of this with an additional level of indirection that people have not explored maybe, but that's an interesting uh, way of exploring. Maybe you decouple this address mapping of the cache from main memory and you have another level of indirection here uh, that decouples this and that way you, you get rid of this part. This, this, this paper doesn't explore that, but I think that's a nice thing to explore. Okay, so how, this is static cache, cache partitioning. This way you don't change partitions. Uh, if you do dynamic cache partitioning, you need to recolor the pages. Let's say these are the, now yellow, green and yellow are the same, That's <laughs> which doesn't work too well. So I guess that projector doesn't understand green. And <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's true, green has yellows. But this is supposed to be green, so this is a different color. So this process, let's say, is allocated three colors, uh, black, green, and yellow. Actually, black is red also, red, green, and yellow. And let's say, uh, after, uh, after an interval, we've determined it should really get four colors. Uh, initially, pages of a process are organized into linked lists by their colors, and memory allocation guarantees that pages are evenly distributed into all the lists to avoid hot points. So basically, we, we allocate pages this way, round robin across the colors. So you have this nice allocation of pages. If you allocate one more color to, uh, to, to a process, now you need to remap. And that is costly. Basically, what you need to do is you need to take these pages, take some pages, and move them to uh, main memory locations that have a different color. And so that you can, so that this load is balanced across different colors. Otherwise, you won't be effectively utilizing the cache, right? And this, ha this obviously has a lot of overhead, right? You allocate page in new color, copy the memory contents, and free the old page. So dynamic cache partitioning with a software-based approach will have a lot of overhead. But we'll see some results. So this is the partitioning algorithm this paper employs in dual core. Initially, uh, the cache is partitioned into eight. Uh, eight colors to this application, eight colors to this other application. And uh, at the end of uh, one epoch, uh, the, uh, this is like a hill climbing algorithm, very simple hill climbing algorithm. At the, at the end of one epoch, uh, you, give, you try two different partitions, two neighboring partitions. You reduce, uh, you, you try seven, nine, and nine, seven. And you look at uh, the partitioning that provides the best metric the best miss rate in this case, minimizes the miss rate. And you keep doing this. So it's a hill climbing like algorithm. It's not look ahead, there's no look ahead, so you could optimize this algorithm. But even with this algorithm, this paper shows some performance benefits. So this is a real system they evaluated the mechanism on, uh, and this is an old system now. Uh, and this is uh, the uh, Linux system. Their uh, L2 cache can be divided into 16 colors in this system, and they use performance monitoring counters to figure out the cache miss rate. And they have an interval length of something that I don't remember. But this is, these are the results. Basically, the goal is to minimize the combined miss rate for these applications. And they, they group the applications somehow. But let's take a look at the average results. If you look at the average results, this is the average performance improvement compared to the baseline system. Uh, there are many cases where static partitioning performs very well. right? There are some cases where dynamic partitioning performs better than static partitioning. Uh, I, I don't think there's a single average, but that's the, uh, in, in uh, overall, uh, cache partitioning actually improves performance, and sometimes static partitioning is better, sometimes dynamic partitioning is better, and 
even in cases where dynamic partitioning has overhead, it sometimes performs very well. So that's the takeaway. And you can read the paper for more. So this gets us back to software versus hardware. Uh, there are a bunch of advantages of software mechanism. There is no need to change the hardware today, right? You could do this today. And you could actually try to devise these mechanisms. And I've seen many people do this and replicate the results. It's easier to upgrade and change the algorithm with software that's not burned into hardware, right? But there are a bunch of disadvantages as well. One is it's less flexible. It's large, it, it needs to operate at this large granularity of page-based instead of way or block-based, right? Uh, you get limited page colors. So you probably get reduced performance per application because you have limited physical memory space. But you can solve that problem with that indirection, but then you need to change the hardware again. That indirection doesn't exist in today's systems. So you get reduced flexibility in this sense. Yeah. This is similar to the granularity issue. And changing partition size has a high overhead because you need to have these page mappings changed. It's actually a lot of high overhead. But I'll describe you a mechanism in the next uh, set of lectures on DRAM that actually uh, improves the, uh, here you need to copy one page to another, right? Normally it's a very slow, uh, slow mechanism to do that. It takes about uh, a millisecond or uh, much, uh, sometimes a millisecond actually to do that copy, depending on where you're copying from. I'll describe a mechanism next week. Uh, if you have a very little modification to DRAM, you can do this copy uh, in 80 nanoseconds or 90 nanoseconds. So if you have something like that, maybe this is not that bad. But that's, if you, oh, that's right. Yeah, scalability is an issue. Let me see if I have that. No, I don't have that. I should add it over here. Yeah, scalability is usually an issue because your algorithm needs to be scalable, right? That's right, exactly. It's, it's going to be very tough if you have a very large number of cores because you don't have enough colors, maybe, first of all. And second, the algorithm may be very tough to Mm, this height. So I think this is not a scalable approach going forward. Adaptivity is slow. Hardware can actually adapt every cycle possibly. Yes. So I, I've seen results where it does work for four cores. Yeah. If you if you do uh, if you have an intelligent partitioning algorithm. That's right. Yeah. But going beyond four cores, I don't know. I, I don't know if this paper has results with four cores. I don't remember. OK. So maybe I should stop here. The rest is uh, interesting, but not, not as fundamental. So we can, uh, we can continue uh, next Monday. Are there any questions, by the way? I'm happy to take questions. But I know people are tired also. Yeah. <laughs>